this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it not gonna make it shine, just gonna let it shine, not gonna make it shine, just gonna let it shine, not gonna make it shine, just gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Ooh, all praises and glory and honor to our God and to our King Jesus, who is the Christ. Yeah, the name by which men can only be saved is through the name of Jesus Christ. And we ought to thank God for the night, for another opportunity to come together and to be enriched and edified through the understanding of his holy and righteous word. My Bible tells me that it is the unfolding of his word that gives light. And it gives understanding to the simple. And so you cannot be blessed by the understanding that is found in God's word until somebody unfolds it for you. And so you ought to be praying for me right now that I will unfold this word properly so that you can receive the riches uh, that are within it. And so we must always uh, show our respect uh, to Pastor Jakari Pierre Davis, the one whom God decided uh, should fall in the footsteps of Pastor Calvin J. Abraham. And I know he's glad that he doesn't have to fill his shoes. All he's got to do is walk in the shoes that God gave him. Yeah, because the same way that God used Calvin J. Abraham, uh, he's going to use Pastor Jagari P. Davis as long as he stays surrendered to him. And I always like to uh, pick, give a little respect to my co-teacher, uh, Pastor Bobby D. Thomas, uh, because Pastor Thomas has been teaching some awesome lessons uh, in this place uh, every Tuesday night. And so as is my custom, uh, if you look on the handout that has been given to you, and I hope that everyone has a handout. Is that true? Amen. And we know that those who may be streaming this later, uh, Sister QB Preacher has sent out the uh, handout via email. And so if you are not on that uh, email distribution list, then you need to uh, shake her tree and let her know that you need to be added so that you can receive the handouts uh, that have been mailed out. And so what you find at the top of that handout is you see the review from last week. And Pastor Thomas continued his lesson on the passion for true service. The believers in Jesus Christ ought to want to be true servants of the one true and living God. And if we have to say there's such thing as a true servant, then obviously there are some servants who are false. Yeah, Jesus Christ fussed at those scribes and those Pharisees for being fake servants of God. Because the one thing that they did is they served God simply to uh, be seen of men, which is what the scripture says. And a true servant never desires to be seen of men. His only desire should be is to please God. So you should care less who's looking at you. The only eyes you should care about is the eyes of God being upon you. And on last week, Pastor Thomas taught from the lesson, ship ship happens yeah and y'all know why i'm emphasizing that ship happens because every one of us are sinners and you know when you heard that your mind went somewhere else so i needed to emphasize ship happens yeah and pastor thomas uh went through and he uh walked through the ships that happen for the true servants of the one true and living god and the first thing he talks about was workmanship yeah, because the Bible says that we are the workmanship of God created in Christ Jesus to do the works that he has predestined for us to do. And so you shouldn't be trying to find something to do. You ought to be beseeching God and ask him, what is the work 
that he would have you to do. Yeah, and next, uh, Pastor Thomas talked about relationship. God did not call us to stand alone. He called us to work together. And so the thing that we have to do uh, is develop relationships with one another. You know, there are some people who say, I don't need to go to church to serve God. And you know what my answer to that is? Lies from the pit of hell. Because God expects you to come into the house of the Lord so that you can develop a relationship with other believers in Jesus Christ. Because when you're having a rough day, the Bible says that others will surround you and help to lift you up. And that's what happens when you have a relationship with other believers. He also talked about companionship. So as true servants of the living God, we are supposed to work together as companions. When Jesus Christ sent out uh, the first witnesses, he sent them out two by two. He did not send them out alone because the Bible says when one falls, there's another one there to pick them up. And so we should have a companion in ministry work. Uh, he also talked about partnership. And the most important partnership that you can have as a true servant of the living God is the partnership that you have with Jesus. Christ himself Jesus Christ say take my yoke upon you and learn of me and so in ministry we don't not only partner with each other but we partner with Jesus Christ himself and Pastor Thomas even though it wasn't in his notes but I liked his ad lib because at the end of his lesson said that when you do all those ships when you let ships happen then that's when you really begin to worship God. And so I thank God for Pastor Thomas. I don't know if any of you have ever sat down and developed a Bible study lesson before uh, or a Sunday school lesson or prepared for the Sunday school lesson. But it is a lot of work. And so put us on your prayer list because the thing that we do not want to do is tell you anything that does not agree with the scriptures. We are not called here to share our opinion with you. We are called here to share what thus saith the Lord with you. And sometimes that means we've got to correct some things that have been falsely said in the past. And so sometimes in this Bible study, you may hear something that contradicts something that you may have heard before, you may have believed before. Well, that means your job is to run to the scriptures to make sure that what's been being said is absolutely true and correct according to God's word. And so on tonight, We'll be looking at Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. And you see, I'm going to do my best to speak from the topic, a passion for the pursuit of God's favor. And the thing that uh, burdens my heart when we talk about the favor of God is that there are many believers that believe that they have God's favor simply because they have surrendered surrendered themselves to Jesus Christ. Something else which is untrue. As believers in Jesus Christ, the favor of God is something that you have to diligently pursue. And y'all have heard it said just like, uh, just like I've heard it said. I'm blessed and highly favored. But yet they ain't doing nothing to serve God. Well, if they aren't doing anything to serve God, then guess what? They are not blessed and they are not highly favored because the ones who are blessed and highly favored are those who are working hard to serve God. So Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 9, and you see I'll be reading from the NIV version. And the beautiful thing about having these uh, phones with the scriptures on there is you've got almost every version of the Bible on that phone and so if you're looking at your phone uh find that niv version and if not uh, i will read it real good because i am an advocate of reading from the book an advocate from reading from the book and so genesis chapter six is any everybody there who wants to be there 
Genesis chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. It says, when man began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they married and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with man forever. Boy, if God had to say my spirit will not contend with man forever, that means there was something wrong with what man was doing. And so it says, for he is mortal. I believe the King James Version said that he is flesh. And the, re and the inference is that he's living according to his own flesh, the desires of his own flesh, and not according to the will of God. It says, for he is mortal. His days will be a hundred and twenty years. Verse 4, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them, they were the heroes of old men of renown. Boy, you need to underline that. They were the heroes of old and men of renown. Verse uh, 5 says, the Lord saw how, how a great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. I believe the King Germ said that the Lord repented that he had made man, that the use of that word repented has confused uh, some folks in understanding about what's happening in the text. And I'll do my best to try to uh, provide some clarification for that. Uh, verse 7 says, so the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah, verse 9 says, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. There's another highlight for you. He walked with God. He walked with God. Noah had the favor of God because he walked with God. Good to see you, brother. Yeah. All right. And so on the handout, you see that we will be emphasizing three main points from this text. For some reason, we have gotten into the habit of pressing three main points. And the three main points that we are going to press tonight are the frustrations of God. On the back, you see the feelings of God. But lastly, we will see the favor of God. And one of my, I believe one of my callings is, is to teach in such a way that you will be able to not only learn, but learn how to study the Bible for yourself. And so the commentary that I've given you under the frustrations of God says, the text continually emphasizes to us. You cannot overlook what the text continually emphasizes, because if you do, you will not understand what God is saying in the text. It's not about what it means to you. It's about what God meant when he put it in his word. And so the text continually emphasizes to us that God was frustrated with the who? The human beings that he had created. The Lord said that it was with humans that his spirit would not contend with forever. Eight times the focus of the text is on who? On human being. That's why we read through it before we uh, go through it because we want to make sure that you hear what was actually placed in the word of God. The, com the uh, commentary continues to say, therefore it should be confusing to us as how some consider the sons of God to be a reference to fallen angels. Anybody other than me? Ever heard this text taught that way? 
that the sons of God were actually fallen angels. Boy, and I see some of y'all looking at me cross-eyed because you might still believe that. But that's why we read the context because the context says nothing about fallen angels. The context tells us that God's frustration was with humans. And so the uh, commentary goes on to say, since we understand scripture according to the context that it is written in, then by no means can the sons of God be a reference to fallen angels. God said what he said and he meant what he meant and he did not put anything about fallen angels in this context. And so the text said, tells us that these sons of God saw the beauty of the daughters of men and were marrying them. Jesus taught us in Matthew 22 and 30. Boy, if you don't believe anybody else, you ought to believe Jesus Christ himself. Jesus taught us in Matthew 22 and 30 that angels neither marry nor are they given in marriage. And sometimes you need to look at different versions of the Bible to provide you some clarification. Because one of the versions that provides some good clarification is the Amplified Bible. And that's what I've made note of in the commentary that I gave you. The Amplified version of the Bible includes the parent parenthetical that the angels do not marry nor do they produce children have you ever seen in scriptures two angels hooking up and having a baby absolutely not you have not you have not seen that because God did not create them to be able to reproduce therefore God's frustration was what not with some angel or human hybrid so i'm back in the commentary on the paper god's frustration was with the human beings that he created especially with those who were born into these unequally yoked marriages and so when you saw the sons of god marrying the daughters of men that's an inference that these were unequally yoked marriages and i try to give you further explanation it says that the sons of god is a reference to the godly lineage of seth and i gave you the scripture so you could see it for yourself genesis 4 25 through 26 because this was the generation that that began calling on the name of the Lord and the daughters of men is a reference to those who were born in the lineage of the ungodly. And that's why we, as soon as we read that scripture, what did we read? That God said, I will no long, will not contend with man forever because he is flesh. God was disappointed because these sons of his were marrying unequally yoked. The commentary goes on to say that it was out of these unequally yoked marriages that the Nephilim were born. The text never emphasizes the size of the Nephilim. And I put in parentheses giants because I believe the King James Version calls them giants. And as soon as you see the word giant, what do you start thinking about? How big they were. But God does not emphasize the size of the Nephilim. But what it does mention is that they were men of renown. Men who were more concerned about making a name for themselves. And you know, as believers in Jesus Christ, our job is not to lift up ourselves. Our job is to lift up the name of Jesus. And so that bonus scripture that I gave you was John 12 and 32. And we know that in that scripture, Jesus said, what? If I be lifted up, then all men will be drawn to me. And so the inference there is, is that when a name is lifted up, then guess what happened? Then those men are drawn to that name that is lifted up. And when men begin to do what? Lift up their own name. Then guess what they're doing? They're drawing men to themselves 
rather than to the name that should be lifted up. And that name is supposed to be Jesus Christ. And so y'all pray for folks who are constantly lifting up their own name as opposed to lifting up the name of Jesus. And so look at Genesis 11 and 4. Genesis 11 and 4. And I gave it to you in the Berean Standard uh, Study Bible. And so it says, Come, they said, let us build for ourselves a city with a tower. And y'all do remember the Tower of, of, of Babel, right? Because that's what this is out of the context of. It says, Come, they said, let us build for ourselves a city with a tower that does what? Reaches to the heavens. Why were they doing it? The text tells you that we may make a name for ourselves. Their desire was to magnify their own names. And it says, and not be scattered over the face of all the earth. And can I tell you, you see what you ought to see in that scripture? That you ought to see two dangerous things in that scripture. These men who were more concerned about making a name for themselves had placed themselves in some serious danger. Because the thing that they did not realize, which is what NASA has taught us, is that after you get so high up in space, there's no breathable air. And so these men who were making a name for themselves were about to place themselves in physical danger. And so one of the reasons why God created different languages among them and caused them to scatter was to protect them from themselves. And so the second thing, the danger that we see is that they say so that we will not be scattered over the face of the earth. And so not only were they putting themselves in physical danger, they were putting themselves in spiritual danger because they were outright defying what God had already told them to do. And so you remember when God created Adam and Eve, what did he tell them? Be fruitful and multiply and do what? And feel the earth. Men were commanded to Feel the earth. God did not plan on just one little section of this earth to be full. He planned on all of the earth to be filled. But what did they outright say? We outrightly defy what God says because we do not want to be scattered upon the earth. And so I gave you the bonus scripture, Genesis 1 and 29, so you can go and read that for yourself. You know, one of my mantras is, is don't believe any preacher. When you hear something being taught or preached to you, go to the word and look it up for yourself. That's how you protect yourself from false teachers of the word of God. And any preacher that tells you, you don't need to look at the word, just listen to what I'm telling you. Then you know you need to run very fast. Yeah, y'all remember what happened in Waco? That's what happened in Waco. What, what, what was his name? Jim Jones. Yeah, what he told them, y'all don't need a Bible. Just listen to what I have to say. And what did he do? He deceived them to the point of destroying themselves. Yeah, and so that's what we want to do. We want to protect ourselves by studying the word of God for ourselves so that we know when something is being said against the word of God, we will be able to spot it immediately because I know what the word says for myself. And so in the takeaway that I gave you in that section, it says when our focus becomes making a name for ourselves, we can place ourselves in danger both physically and spiritually because it is, that it, it is this that can place us on a direct course of being in contention with God himself. And the last thing you ought to want to do is be on the side that's opposite the side that God is on. Because guess what it'll be? It'll be a fight <laughs> that you cannot win. Yeah. All right. So flip your papers over. And let's go to that second section. And that sec second section is the feelings of God. I don't know if you ever thought about that before, but God has feelings. Y'all know why you have feelings? 
because God has feelings. We were created in the very image of God, and God is a very feeling God. And so let's read the commentary up under the second section. Verses 5 through 7 reveals that because the Nephilim became more concerned about making a name for themselves, the human race did what? Began to decline. Do y'all know why this world is declining? Because men are more concerned with making a name for themselves than lifting up the name of Jesus Christ. The commentary goes on to say the text tells us that the wickedness of the human race became very great and the thoughts of their hearts were continually evil. Y'all know that we serve the God that can read your heart. The Bible said that he knows your thoughts even before you think them. And can you imagine a holy God having to listen to evil thoughts continually? But the context goes on to say, when the focus of human beings is making a name for themselves, then wickedness and evil becomes an option for them because they do not place limitations on their selves. They're going to do what? Create a name for themselves by any means and in any way. And I gave you that bonus scripture, John 11, 47 through 48. And when you go to read that for yourself, read the whole context and guess what you'll find out is that is exactly what sent Jesus to the cross. The Bible says that the fame of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ began going throughout the whole earth. And because the fame of Jesus Christ was going throughout the whole earth, the Pharisees and the scribes felt like the people were going more towards him than towards, more towards him rather than them. And because they cared more about their name than his name, the Bible says then that's when they began to make plans. To kill him. And so what sent Jesus to the cross was because these men envied Jesus to the point of wanting to get rid of him. So they could be the ones who would be admired and no longer be the people admiring Jesus Christ. The commentary goes on to say, it is at this point where God begins to share with us how he feels about the wickedness of human beings. The text says, especially in the NIV, that God regretted making human beings. The King James says that he repented making human beings and his heart was deeply troubled. King James says grieved. And so in the original Hebrew language, the word regretted or repented actually means to sigh or to breathe heavily. Every time you see the word repent in scripture, it does not mean to change your mind. It means sometimes to breathe heavily or to sigh. That's why we understand scripture according to the context that is written in. And that's why the scripture also tells us that God was grieved or deeply troubled in his heart. God became disgusted by the wickedness and the evil that filled the earth. Therefore, the text tells us that to alleviate the problem of evil that filled the earth, God would wipe the human race from the face of the earth. Consequences that the human race had brought upon themselves. And so I sum, this is the summation that I gave you. It should become obvious that what we should not want to do is grieve or trouble the heart of God because the consequences can be dire. Boy, and I heard an old preacher say, if you can't say amen, then say ouch. Because sometimes the scriptures demand an ouch. And I knew that would be kind of rough, so I had to spice it up with a little bit of good news. And so that's why I gave you Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 9, which is said that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the reason why he died for us was to save us from the wrath of God. And so if it had not been for Jesus Christ, guess what? 
God would have done the same thing during these times that he had done in those times. That's why the scripture says in the fullness of time. God sent his son because in the fullness of time, the inference is, is that God was at the point where he was about to have enough. And if he had not sent Jesus Christ to be the propitiation for our sins, then we would have been doomed in our day, just like they were doomed in their day. And so look at me, look with me to Isaiah 63 verses nine through 10. It says in all their distress, he too was distressed. Do you know that we serve that kind of God? That when you feel distressed, then God gets distressed with you. God takes it personal when his children go through things. It says he too was distressed and the angel of his presence did what? Save them. Our God saves us from uh, depressions and distressed situations that we deal with. It goes on to say, in his love and mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. Boy, that sounds real good, don't it? But the problem comes when you read the next verse because this is how they repaid God for his love and for his mercy. Verse 10 says, yet they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So what did God do? He turned and became their enemy, and he himself fought against them. And so the takeaway that I gave you in that section says, the consequences of grieving the heart of God can result in finding yourself becoming an enemy of God, which puts you in a fight that you cannot win. He's got all power. We only got a ski taste of power. So why would we rebel against a God who we cannot fight against? And so uh, last section that I gave you, and then we'll be done with the uh, lesson text for tonight, is the favor of God, which is the main point that I want to press on tonight. Because remember, I told you that just because you gave your life to Jesus Christ, it does not mean that you automatically have the favor of God. The favor of God has to be pursued. And so the commentary says that we should be grateful to God that even though there can be dire consequences for grieving the heart of God, there is a way to counteract the effects, which is to do what? To walk faithfully with God. And, uh, and when the Bible talks about walking with God, it's, talk, it's metaphorically talking about living your life for God. Remember, I've told y'all once before that our goal and our aim is to please God. And so everything that you venture to do or anything you find yourself doing, you ought to ask yourself the question, how? Can I please God? Bible says even when it comes down to doing simple things like eating and drinking, you're supposed to do it to the glory of God. And one of the things that we don't realize is that people are watching us everywhere. And when your efforts are to glorify God, they see you as somebody who takes God seriously. You know, I've testified uh, in this place a couple of times before how one time my wife and I were in IHOP. I think that was IHOP where we were, wasn't it? And we do what we normally do. We just say something we do. I take my hat off because I love wearing caps. Yeah, if I'm not wearing a cap, I feel naked, so y'all pray for me. But I took my cap off, I reached my hand across the table, and I began praying with my wife. And as soon as we finished praying, there was a man standing by the table crying. And through his tears, he said, y'all reminded me of what I'm supposed to be doing. Being unafraid to demonstrate my love for Jesus Christ and God out in the public. You never know what will happen. When your desire is to please God. Brother uh, Yarbrough brought up the three Hebrew boys in the text. And, 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 and who, the three Hebrew boys were associates of Daniel. 
And because the three Hebrew boys and Daniel were unafraid to demonstrate their commitment to their relationship with God. Y'all know what happened to Nebuchadnezzar? He ended up giving his life and surrendering his life to the one true and living God. Read Daniel chapter 4. It says that he fell down on his knees and he lifted up the name of the one true God. Simply because the three Hebrew boys and Daniel were unafraid to demonstrate their commitment to the one true and living God. And so the commentary uh, finishes to say that through the life of Noah, God shows us that when we walk faithfully with God, we can find the favor of God as opposed to fighting against him. What did the scripture say? God was ready to wipe the earth clean. But then we see one of the greatest words in scripture, but. And Noah found himself behind that but. Yeah. Noah, oh, I ain't going to say that. I was getting ready to say Noah was doing the but. But, you know, y'all might be too holy for that. But when, script, but when believers do the but, that means we're living what? Contradictory to the way that the world is living. And so Noah was living contradictory to the way that the world was living. And how many people found favor with God? Only Noah. And he did it because he chose to live like God wanted him to live. So if you want the favor of God, you have to commit yourself to living like God wants you to live. And so I gave you in that last scripture reference, Genesis 7 and 1. Genesis 7 and 1. If you want to read it with me, to keep me in check, Genesis 7 and 1. And if it, find, if it takes you very long to find Genesis 7 and 1, come see me after service. Yeah, <laughs> Genesis 7 and 1. And I'm going to wait for everybody to get there who wants to get there. Everybody there? Genesis 7 and 1 says, the Lord then said to Noah, who else did he say it to? Nobody else, but to Noah. Noah, go into the ark. What did the ark represent? The place of safety for him. When God would pour out the flood upon the earth, he told him to go into the ark, you and your family. Was, was God uh, considering his family uh, an exempt? Absolutely not. Because if you study the scripture, especially in scriptures that I've given you, like 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, it calls uh, Mo, I mean, uh, Noah a preacher of righteousness. And so for the 120 years that God had set to, that he had the limitation that he had placed on the wickedness of the world the bible said that noah was preaching what was right in the sight of god and the reason why his family was included was because they believed in the way noah lived his life and the preaching that came out of his mouth and because they also believed in the way that he was living his life and the preaching that came into, uh, out of his mouth, they were willing to repent. And guess what happened to them? They were delivered just like Noah. And so that's why we ought to work hard being little Noahs, right? Because we never know that the way that you live your life and the preaching that comes out of your mouth. It might cause somebody else to surrender the, the, their lives to Christ the same way that you have surrendered. I don't think there was anybody who came out of their womb saying, I surrender all, all to him I owe. None of us. God sent some what? Some witnesses into your life. You saw the evidence from somebody else's life. And that's what influenced you to want to live your life for Christ. And the same way others influenced us. God wants us to be what? An influence to somebody else. And so that takeaway that I gave you in that last section, the passionate pursuit of the favor of God can cause us to be delivered from some things that others go through who have refused the opportunity to walk with him. Pursuing the favor of God can save you from a whole lot of mess. 
but you've got to be what? Passionate about pursuing it. And the reason why we have to be passionate about it, because guess what the devil's working hard to do? Trying to get you to turn away from it. And we should refuse to let the devil turn us away from the things that we know that God would have us to do. And when you set it, make that up in your mind, settle it in your mind, then guess what you then have? The favor of Almighty God. Amen? All right, somebody give the Lord a hand clap for his awesome and his wonderful word. And so y'all know that's where we turn uh, to the camera and we talk uh, to somebody who may be streaming online who has finally surrendered it based on some of the things that you've heard, you are now ready uh, to give your life to Jesus Christ. And I've said before, you do not have to do the traditional thing and come give your hand to the preacher and give your heart to God. You can do that right where you are right now. When I gave my life to Jesus Christ, I gave it, I gave my life to Jesus Christ in my bedroom. And when I started coming to church, I was already saved. And so you can do yourself a favor. And give your life to Jesus Christ right now where you are. Because tomorrow is not promised to you. And so the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. Do not harden your heart. And so if you feel God tweaking your heart saying today should be that day, then you need to surrender to him. But always, we always uh, offer the invitation that if you're already saved and you do not have a church home, then come visit us. Our arms are open and we'll be ready to draw you in and, uh, and, and, and treat you like you're one of our very own. And so if you have accepted the, uh, Jesus Christ on tonight, the Bible says that the angels are rejoicing in heaven. But if you're looking for a church home, then uh, call the church and we'll be happy to provide you any further information. Amen? Amen. Oh.